ahead and welcome back to the third hour of our program. On the line with us is Dr. Bruce Grayson, MD. He is the Carlton or Carlson Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia Health System and the author of a new book, After a Doctor Explores What Near-Death Experiences Reveal About Life and Beyond. His website, Bruce Grayson, G-R-E-Y-S-O-N. Uh, that's also his Twitter handle, at Bruce Grayson. And uh, Dr. Grayson, welcome to the program. It's an absolutely fascinating book and an absolutely fascinating topic. Can, can you start out by uh, telling us what got you interested in looking into near-death experiences? Yeah, well, well, thank you for having me on the show, Tom. I'm, I'm glad to be able to talk to you today. Um, you know, you know I, I was raised in a materialistic scientific household where there was no talk about spirituality or religion. We just assumed that if it wasn't physical, it wasn't real. And when you die, you die. That's the end of it. And that was fine with us. And then I went through college and medical school with that mindset. And then when I started my psychiatric training, I started being confronted by patients who claimed they had left their bodies when they were almost dead and could see things and hear things from an out-of-body perspective while they were apparently unconscious. Uh, and I, I couldn't make any sense out of that. I thought they were just you know, psychiatric patients who knows what they're saying. And about five years later, after I collected a few of these cases, one of my colleagues, Raymond Moody, published a book called Life After Life, in which he gave us this name, Near-Death Experiences, and described what they were like. And I realized for the first time that these patients were who were telling me these stories weren't just making things up, but they were part of a worldwide phenomenon that was quite common. I I, I remember Moody's book. Um, in fact, my my uh, wife's father had uh, surgery and told stories Ooh. about what he heard yes. in the room. I, you know, what, it wasn't isn't there a general belief that well maybe the anesthetic is just not quite as effective as we think it is or something like that. Or are you finding, were you finding stories in your research and, and the research of others of people, you know, where it has gone way beyond something that just could have been overheard in the, in the operating room, for example, if the, if the anesthetic was, was not uh, working the way it should? Sure, Tom. It does go way beyond what you can hear if the anesthesia wasn't working. People see things, people are aware of things, not only in the operating room, but often at a distance that they couldn't possibly have known if it was just a hallucination based on anesthesia or if they were somehow still hearing things despite the fact that they were, they were unconscious. Can you give us some examples? Sure. Um, one fellow I knew was a 55-year-old truck driver who was driving around with his truck and he had crushing chest pain. And he made it to the emergency room where they tested him and found he had four blood vessels to his heart that were clogged. So they rushed him to the operating room for an emergency quadruple bypass. And he told me that in the middle of the operation, he looked down at his body and saw his surgeon flapping his elbows like he was trying to fly. Now, when he told me this, I had been a doctor for about 30 years. I couldn't imagine this was really happening. I'd never heard of anything so ridiculous. So I, I said to him, you know, I wonder if you were, there, you were there hallucinating. And he insisted it was true and he insisted that I talk to his doctor and ask him about it. So I tracked down his doctor and his doctor said, well, yes, I do do that. I developed this habit. I've never seen anyone else do it. I let my assistants start the operation, and when I get gowned and gloved, my sterile gown and gloves on, I walk into the operating room and watch them start the procedure. And I don't want to risk touching anything that's not sterile, so I place my hands flat on my chest where I know they won't touch anything. And I point things out to them with my elbows so I don't accidentally touch something non-sterile. And he illustrated just the way the patient did. Hmm. And there's no way the patient could have known that unless he had actually seen it, as he said. Wow. Yeah. The second chapter of your book is titled Outside of Time. Yes. Tell us about this. Well, most near-death experiences say that in this realm or dimension where the NDE takes place, there is no sense of time as we know it. There's no linear flow of time. It's as if everything is happening all at once, past, present, future. There's no distinction. Um, and that's kind of puzzling to me because they, they, they describe it as this was a sequence of events. This happened and this, then this. And I don't see how you can have that without having a passage of time. And they tell me, well, it's a paradox when I tell you about it here. But when I was living it, it wasn't a paradox at all. And you hear people talking about, I mean, you, you can see this through the, through the centuries. People have written about their near-death experiences, talk about 
reliving their entire lives in great detail. And the whole near-death experience only took a matter of a second or two. Uh, so clearly they have a sense of time being different in the near-death experience. Now, I, I confess I, I read your book quite some time ago, and or several months ago anyway, uh, maybe a little longer. And I believe that what I'm about to describe is, a, is an article that I read recently. You, you probably know uh, there was this, uh, I believe it was an article about that showed that when people are in the process of dying, that the type of brain, and, and, and they found this from people who were somehow wired to EEGs when they weren't expected to, be die, to, to die, but they did die. Um, and the type of brain activity was the kind of brain activity that's typically associated with, you know, deep dive into memory. Can you, do you, right, I, right. are you familiar with this? Uh, yes, that was actually one single case of an 87 year old man who had a traumatic brain injury and a subdural hematoma, and he had uh, seizures that would not stop. So this was not a normal brain by any means. Mm -hmm. And they had him hooked up to an EEG to measure his seizures when he happened to have a heart attack and died. So they had recordings of his brain waves before, during, and after his death. And it showed a relative increase in one type of brain wave. It, it was a decrease, but compared to other brain waves, it was a relative increase. And they said that type of brain wave can be associated with memory. Unfortunately, it's also associated with many other things, including intention to move, uh, strong emotion, and most importantly, it's highly associated with muscle artifact from the skull. For example, if you're clenching your teeth or wrinkling your forehead, that will cause the same types of tracings on the EEG. Mm. So it wasn't clear what they were really measuring. Yeah. So uh, chapter 11 of your book, The Mind is Not the Brain. Um, right. uh, you know, we tend to think of our brains as this computer um, and our minds as something that lives within it. How, how, how are you disassociating these? Well, yeah, of course, I grew up with that model also, that the mind is what the brain does. Yeah, very Cartesian. And certainly there, there's um, evidence for that. You know, when you get intoxicated, you don't think very clearly. Or when you get a stroke or hit on the head, that affects your thinking. So in normal everyday life, it seems as if mind and brain are the same thing. But in extreme circumstances, they seem to separate. One example is the near-death experience, when people's brains are demonstrably going offline, and yet they report having the most vivid experiences they've ever had. But there are others as well. For example, there's something called terminal lucidity, in which people with end-stage Alzheimer's disease whose brains have been seriously deteriorating and they can't uh, recognize family or communicate, suddenly become completely lucid again and can talk, carry on conversations, recognize people. And then a few hours later, they die. And there's no explanation for this in medical terms of how this can possibly happen. The brain can't regenerate itself. We've also done, in the past 20 years, neuroimaging of people having psychedelic drug trips. And what we found, to our surprise, was that the more elaborate mystical drug experiences are associated with a decrease in brain activity, not an increase as we thought it would be. Yeah, I, I have to say, uh, taking LSD when I was uh, 16 or 17 years old altered my understanding of yes. <laughs> life uh, for my entire life. I mean, I, I right. still carry that memory. Uh, and, uh, and in a very positive way, I'm not uh, suggesting anybody should do it, but uh, it was right. a it was a turning point for me, a spiritual turning point. Which brings me yes. to uh, I'm curious your thoughts on the spirituality of all this, on on the idea of of of, of the permanence of consciousness or the the transportation of consciousness um, as defined by reincarnation in some of our religions, or yeah. uh, you know what. What are your thoughts based on all this research about that? Well, it, it seems clear to me from near-death experiences and other phenomena that the, our consciousness, our minds, that part of us that thinks and feels, are not limited solely to the brain, and yet they seem in everyday life to be associated with the brain. So what is the relationship? Well, people are using the idea that the brain is a filter for the mind. An example is a television set. There are hundreds of television stations being beamed at you all the time. If you tried to watch them all at once, you wouldn't be able to understand them. But the television set receives these signals and filters out all but one, the one you want to watch. And that allows you to use it, to see it and hear it. And the idea is that the brain does the same thing. It receives thoughts and feelings from the mind, wherever that is, and 
rule, uh, eliminates, filters out all the irrelevant things, things like encountering deceased loved ones, encountering a deity, and just lets in the quote, important things, the things that the brain was designed to do to help you survive in the physical world, find food, shelter, a mate, avoid predators. So the mind normally just filters out all these irrelevant quote, spiritual things. But in a situation where the brain is shutting down like a near death experience, that filtering function gets weakened and all these other phenomena come in. You get a, a flowering of consciousness as you did with your LSD trip. Um, and other things come in that you normally don't have access to. So does that, we have about a minute and a half left here. Does that suggest to you that, that there is consciousness beyond life and death? Definitely does. Yes, I can't How? prove it. I'm not sure. I may be mis misreading the data, but it seems as if consciousness can survive without the brain and after the brain has died. And where does this consciousness come from and where does it go when we die? That's a great question, Tom. I have no idea. Yeah, yeah me neither. <laughs> but it does, you know, it has occurred to me on more than one occasion, uh, particularly when I took that LSD trip, that first one, that the entire universe is made of consciousness. Yes. What, yes. what do you think about that theory? Well, a lot of philosophers are coming to that conclusion now. And in fact, a lot of um, quantum physicists are coming to that conclusion as well, that consciousness is a part of the universe just the way matter is and that it's not uh, built from matter, but it's independent of matter and exists along with it. That perhaps matter itself might even be slowed down consciousness if consciousness is energy? Well, some people are saying that. I'm not sure I understand how that could happen, but that it is a theory that being, that's being proposed. Well, the math would be the amount of energy necessary to make yeah. a piece of matter would be the energy times the speed of yes. light squared, right? Yes. <laughs> there yes. you go. Okay, uh, brilliant work. Dr. Bruce Grayson, MD. The book is After a Doctor Explores What Near-Death Experiences Reveal About Life and Beyond. Bruce Grayson, G-R-E-Y-S-O-N.com, and Bruce Grayson on Twitter. Dr. Grayson, thank you so much for dropping by today. Thank you, Tom. I enjoyed talking to you. Back at you. Thank you so much. And thanks for writing a brilliant book.